Okay, so Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. So our topic is the dazzle of Western knowledge, which is taken from Atbal's share that my eyes were not dazzled by the glitter of Western knowledge, they were protected by the dust of Medina and Najaf. So, we start by noting that the knowledge is central to the Islamic message. Allah Ta'ala taught Adam alayhi salam the names and then the angels were made to prostrate before him, showing the value of knowledge. Uh, the first wahi starts with Allah Ta'ala introduces himself as a teacher and he says that he is, I'm going to give you some knowledge which nobody had at this time and we can see the effects of this knowledge which led uh, the ignorant and backwards uh, Bedouin to become leaders of the world. So it was a very powerful knowledge. The Quran and the Hadith is, is full of the praise of knowledge and the um, rewards for acquiring knowledge. So the question that we want to focus on today, the central question I think which faces the Ummah is what is this knowledge that Allah Ta'ala gave to man? This powerful knowledge which took uh, the most backward civilization on the planet to leaders of the world, does this knowledge have the same power today? If so, then uh, what happened? How come we don't have? If we have this knowledge, then we should be able to use it in this way. Today, the Muslims all over the planet are most backwards and in many ways, many conditions prevailing among the Muslims are similar to those of the Jahiliyyah. So, has the message lost its power? So Allah Ta'ala tells us that uh, let them rejoice, yani, that is <coughs> us, that we should, we have been given the best knowledge and it is better than all that they accumulate. Now the standard tafsir says that all that they accumulate refers to the <coughs> wealth of the dunya. <coughs> but I would like to think that but Allah Ta'ala is telling us is better than all the knowledge that they can gather. So, I would like to say that the central battle facing the Ummah today is the intellectual battle. The, we have to prove to ourselves that the knowledge given to us in this book is superior to all that Einstein has discovered and Newton has discovered and uh, all of the uh, all of the accomplishments of the West on the intellectual domain are nothing compared to the Quran. And today the Ummah does not believe this because if we just look at the investment of time being made by the Ummah in acquisition of knowledge of the West and compare it with the time spent being spent on acquisition of the knowledge coming from our own intellectual tradition, you see that it's like 1 to 100. So it means that whether explicitly or implicitly, the Ummah as a whole, and this includes myself, believes that Western knowledge is more powerful, more valuable, uh, more important for our guidance today, at least in the matter of the world, then the Quran and Hadith and our own intellectual tradition. So the central, um, the central message of my talk uh, and also of my work is that this is an illusion and this illusion is created by the problem that Iqbal refers to, that our eyes have been bedazzled by the glitter and the glamour of the Western knowledge and it is very bright and attractive, but there is nothing behind it. It is, it is a hoax. This knowledge is not what it seems to be. And the knowledge of the Quran is indeed 
the most important and most valuable and most precious knowledge that anyone could have. But because our eyes have been dazzled, we cannot see this. And because we cannot see this, we cannot benefit from the knowledge that the Quran has to offer. So the problem that I am saying is a spiritual problem. There are many ahadiths and um, I think this is also mentioned in the Quran that if you are given this great gift, the greatest gift that God has given to mankind, but you do not value it as, as such, you think that this is not the best. I have uh, explicitly yani, heard Muslims say that uh, the knowledge of the uh, chemistry and biology and physics is superior to our intellectual tradition. So today the Ummah as a whole is convinced that the solution to the problems of the Ummah we must ask from the West. We must get economic advice and uh, we must change our political models to democracy and governance to Western models. Even, even, even when it comes to ethics, Muslim teachers who make the Hajjud are teaching business ethics using a text uh, written in the West. So there is nothing we have. Our Quran and Hadith have nothing to offer for today. So this is actually uh, Kufr. Kufr has the sense of lack of gratitude for the gifts of Allah. It also has other sense, rejection, but the sense in which I am using it is that uh, is the opposite of shukr. So shukr is to appreciate the gift of Allah, but kufr is to not appreciate it, reject it. And this is a spiritual disease and the ummah is suffering from this spiritual disease. And the solution is to understand the nature of knowledge and why the knowledge given of the, to us in the Quran is superior to everything that the West has gathered over the past three or four centuries. So to understand this issue, we have to understand how our own thought processes have been shaped to make us believe that Western knowledge offers us guidance which is superior to the Quran. Why do we look to the West to solve our economic problems given that the West is facing such huge economic problems? Why do they look to their educational problems when uh, to their models in uh, shaping our society, our culture, our politics, our economics when these models are not actually working very well in the West themselves. So the answer is that the globe was colonized. About at least 90% of the Muslim lands were directly or indirectly under the influence of the West. And the conquest or colonization is primarily a conquest of minds and a conquest of knowledge. This is something which is not widely realized. That we, we think of conquest and colonization as physical colonization, as uh, application of force to acquire control. But the control is mainly psychological. It is not possible for a handful of people, 1000 British administrators, to control a, a population of millions without psychological and mental control. And this is made explicit in uh, Macaulay's Minute, which is very famous. And so he says that a single shelf of a good European library is worth the whole uh, of our own intellectual tradition. Now I believe that uh, Muslims have accepted this. That is, uh, if you look in the houses of the educated Muslims, you will find thousands of books from the West, hundreds of books from the Western intellectual tradition, and very, very few or none from the Islamic intellectual tradition. 
Yes, we will have Qurans and Tafsirs, but this is not part of the intellectual tradition. So, the second thing that uh, Macaulay says in this minute is that we need to create a class which will be a go-between. This class will be Indian in blood and color, but English in tastes, opinions and morals and in intellect. So this we can call the coconut class. So the brown on the outside, but white on the inside. And the process of colonization led to this coconut class, if, of which I am a, a, a card-carrying member, uh, to, to be the uh, rulers and the elites and the people in power. And these people, the coconuts, we control the country, we control the educational processes, and we control the minds of the populace. So if our minds are full of the idea of the superiority of the West and the inferiority of our own heritage, our own culture, our own traditions and our own religion, then this uh, inferiority complex will be transmitted to the masses. So today, the central problem facing Pakistan is the extreme divergence between the elite classes and the bureaucrats, the coconut class, which was actually trained by the British to be go-betweens and to be English in their tastes and morals and opinions and intellect, and the masses who are actually uh, not so deeply influenced because they, are, they have not received the Western education. So they are, so the masses yearned for creating the Republic of Medina, while the elite and the masses, the elite wants to create New York and London and Paris. And so because the masses are pulling in a different direction and the elites are pulling in a different direction, no progress takes place. So the key thing is not, see the, the, the masses, the, the, if you ask for a diagnosis from the elites of what is the problem facing Pakistan, and it's the same uh, situation in the Ummah everywhere, the elites will say, you know, our masses are uneducated, they are illiterate, they do not understand the benefits of democracy, they do not have science, our uh, people are not publishing articles in uh, established journals, we are not winning Nobel Prizes, we, have, we don't have universities, we don't have doctorates, and so this is basically what we need. That is a dramatically false and wrong diagnosis, because basically what we are saying is that uh, we need Western education, we need to provide our masses with Western education in order to uh, make progress. And the Ummah has in Jahiliya, and because they don't have Western education, and the solution to our problem lies in Western education. So instead of trying to analyze as members of the coconut class, and basically I can say that anybody who understands English is automatically uh, member of the coconut class. Uh, you can't escape. So, uh, we have to understand that instead of thinking that the problem lies with the masses who don't have a Western education, let's start by changing this idea and thinking that the problem lies in our own minds, which has been indoctrinated by a Western education. <coughs> so, how does, how does this indoctrination take place? Well, it's very, very simple. They don't really have to say anything. It's just that if you go through four years of a bachelor's degree in either the West or the East, because East is just a copy of the West, an inferior copy, um, you will receive courses in biology, physics, chemistry, mathematics, social sciences, and all sorts of things, but every single book that you read will have its basis in the intellectual tradition of the West. It's possible that the name on it might be a Pakistani name or a Japanese name or a Chinese name. This doesn't make any difference. The, the book will 
convey to us knowledge created by Western intellectuals. So, without any explicit teaching of this message, we learn by practice, by experience, and this is the deepest form of learning, that all useful knowledge today is a product of the West. There is no mention of the Quran or the Hadith or any of the uh, Islamic intellectuals and this automatically means that they are irrelevant for today. So implicitly or explicitly we learn that the cream of Western knowledge today, the best possible knowledge has been produced by the West and this is the apex of human wisdom. So the question is, is this really true? And uh, of course, we want to say that this is not true. And we want to say that there are many, many, uh, that the, the most important form of knowledge is not covered by a Western education. And this most important knowledge is the one that is given to us in the Quran. But we have been trained not to believe this. So what is the most important question that we all face? Uh, well, it should be obvious if we reflect on it. It will not be obvious if we don't reflect because we have been trained not to believe in it, not to think about it. But the most important question is how should I spend my life? I have only one short life to live. I have only a brief amount of time uh, to spend on this earth. So how should I live this life? Should I be kind and gentle or should I, should I be cruel and greedy? Uh, now, no matter how much chemistry or mathematics or biology you will study, you will not find the answer to these questions. No, uh, no amount of uh, uh, education that we receive of the sciences that have been developed by the West will give us an answer to the question of how we can build, how we can become better people, how we can take nafs e ammara and lead it to become nafs al and to become nafs al -mutma And these questions, basically the, the most important question is this, Allah Ta'ala tells us in the Holy Quran that every human life is worth that of the entire planet. If you save a life, it is as if that you have saved all of the human beings on the planet. If you take a life, it is as if you have destroyed all of these lives. Now, according to our Western training, according to my Western training, this doesn't make any sense. How can one equals one billion? It is even worse than the Trinity formula, which says only that one equals three. Now, Allah Ta'ala is telling us that one is equal to one billion, or seven billion actually, seven billion lives. So this doesn't make any sense. That because we are thinking according to the training we have received in the West and not according to the uh, Sufia who told us that you are not a drop in the ocean, you are the entire ocean contained within one drop. So once we start open our minds and hearts to the ways of thinking that are taught to us in our own intellectual tradition, we will see that the Allah Ta'ala is talking here about the potential. Every human being is like a seed which has the potential to become a tree. And the tree has potential to generate thousands of seeds which have all have potential to become trees. So potentially, every human life is infinitely precious if we realize this potential. So the most important question for us is to how can we develop the enormous amount of potential that has been placed inside our heart and how can, how can we realize this potential? Now the question is, uh, does anyone, any of the courses in the West address this question? They, does, it's not that, do they answer the question? Do they even formulate the question? Can they even realize what the question is all about? They cannot even pose this question. So it doesn't even, the Western American doesn't even tell us what is the most important question that we must uh, 
think about an answer for our lives. So here are some Western answers to this what is the most important question. So Einstein said that the most important question is this universe a friendly place? Well, uh, we have already been given the answer to this question in the Quran. Allah Ta'ala tells us that Allah Ta'ala wrote for himself mercy. So it means that this universe is a friendly place. Allah Ta'ala wants us to succeed. He has uh, promised to forgive us. He has promised to make his mercy ghalib over his ghazab. And so we know the answer to this, which Einstein did not know. Uh, here is a, a very pra practical um, businessman who asks about what is the five most important questions. Uh, he is talking about the business and he says that the most important question is what is the mission of the organization. So I think that uh, more or less this is correct except that we don't run corporations. The most important question that you and I face is what is the purpose of my life? If I don't know the purpose of my life, I will, I will not utilize it in the right way. So here is Jung, he says, uh, what the most important question is, what myth am I living? Well, I think that he is a wise man of the West because anybody who is not living on Islam is living in a myth and a fable. And if he realizes this, then he can learn that why, instead of wasting his life following false illusions and dreams, he should come to the nur of Islam. So I guess Carl Jung is in fact right about this, that for people who don't have the nur of Islam, they should wake up and realize that they are living a myth. And of course, here is a humanist. Why is that child crying? Well, maybe because he was not born on uh, he was not born into an Islamic tradition and his parents are training him away from the natural beauty of Islam. So, what I want to say is that the West does not even, Western education does not, uh, does not even teach us the important questions that we need to ask to be able to live our lives properly. So the central questions that our life poses to us is that who am I? What, what is my identity? Where did I come from? Where I am going to go? What will happen to me at the end of my life, life journey? And what should I do with these precious humans of life? What can I become? What are the capabilities that I have and how can I develop them? Actually, I can become a computer programmer or I can become a chess player or I can become uh, the world champion in racing or I can learn how to uh, in, in car racing or I can learn how to run a four minute mile. Uh, but any of these efforts, any of these capabilities that I try to develop, they will take a lot of time and energy and effort. Should I become the best businessman in the world? Should I become... So what? which capability should I develop? If I don't know the answer to these questions, then I will set myself a illusion, a myth for a goal and I will pursue it all my life and at the end of my life I will find that I have been chasing the wrong uh, goal and I have been worshipping the wrong God. Basically the concept, Islamic concept of God is that the, the, the thing that we desire to please. So one very important question for self-analysis is who is my audience? Who am I trying to please? We are always trying to, we are trained from birth, from, from in our early childhood, we try to please our parents and sometimes we go grow through our whole lives trying to please our parents or our peers, our friends, our social circle. So, um, it is actually a very important part of our self-analysis to understand who am I trying to impress? What am I trying to do? The, the things that I am trying to do with my life, what, who is my audience? And basically Islam teaches us that uh, La ilaha illallah means that make your 
Allah Ta'ala, your only audience. The only one you are trying to please is Allah Ta'ala. You don't care about anything else. And this is very, very, very hard to do, by the way. But at least we understand what it means. Because of the benefit of our own intellectual tradition, we cannot understand this from a Western education. And this is the most important question. Who is my audience? Who am I trying to please? With my, with my whole life, from my birth to death, my whole life is an act, a drama. Uh, somebody is non-mute. Please uh, mute your phone. Yeah, so this act that I'm, the life is, as Shakespeare said, life is a play and uh, we are acting. And so we have to realize who we are acting for and the purpose of the kalama is to try to create in us the awareness that the only, only audience is Allah Ta'ala. All else are just puppets. They don't matter. And the only one who can uh, hurt me and the only one who can help me and reward me and recognize me and love me is Allah Ta'ala. And so all our actions should be directed solely towards Allah Ta'ala. And this is not one of the lessons that the Western education teaches us. In fact, quite the opposite. Well, Allah Ta'ala teaches us that the life of this world is about play and amusement. And today we have gotten very, very serious about this play because that's the teaching of the West. That this world and the life of this world is all important. In fact, there is nothing else. One of the not so hidden messages of a Western education is that the only the life of this earth matters. There is nothing after that. So we have to do, we have to make it count, but not in the sense that Allah Ta'ala teaches us to make it count. We have to make it count in the sense that we have to maximize the pleasure that we get and we have to pursue power and pleasure and profits. Uh, and that is the purpose of life that we are taught. Now, the education that we have received is designed actually to turn us into uh, standardized parts of a machine for production of wealth. So, we have been given job skills and we have been turned into human resources, not into human beings. Basically, you can, if you want to put it in a nutshell, the content of this lecture can be said that Western education produces human resources and Allah Ta'ala and his message produces human beings. And uh, our poets have understood this when they have uh, said that Pas ki mushkil laharik Kaam ka asa hona, aadmi ko bhi muyassar nahi insa hona. So we are all created as uh, as uh, human bodies, uh, human in form, but to become a human person, to become a human uh, being, uh, to travel through these stages of spiritual progress is not at all easy. So. Uh, we have been, the, the knowledge that we have given is actually poisonous. It gives us, uh, it is built on foundations which are deadly and um, there are, um, I'm going to try to discuss some of these toxic philosophies that we have learned, but uh, the philosophy is separate from the instrument that has been used to feed these in this into our mind. So there is the medicine which is contained in the bottle and then there is the spoon in which the medicine is placed which enables the administration of this medicine to the uh, mind, to our minds. And the spoon is the Eurocentric history that we have been taught. And so uh, this is uh, we have to differentiate between there is there is a deadly philosophy which I which is the goal of my lecture to analyze but my fear is that I will not be able to get to that except in a very uh, minimal way and then there is the methodology by which we have been made to believe 
that this is the most important thing for us to learn. And basically, we have been taught a false history, and I have given a link to a whole lecture on what this false history is and, and what is the truth about this. But uh, in a nutshell, again, in, in one sentence, you can say that the history that we have been taught says that only the European nations have created valuable knowledge, and this is the only advanced civilization on the planet. All other races are primitive, ignorant, ignorant, barbaric, savages. And the way for us to come out of our ignorance and come out of our barbarism and, and uh, come out of our primitive culture is to learn uh, from the West because they are the most advanced. And uh, an example of this is Salman Rushdie. He wrote the book Shame in which he basically shows his contempt and ridicule for his own family and his own society and his own culture. And he wrote the book Midnight Children, which shows his contempt for his uh, nation, for his people, for their politics, for their heritage, for their culture. And then he wrote this Midnight Children, which shows the contempt for his religion and for the intellectual traditions of this religion for the hadith and for the transmission of the hadith and so on. So basically he is ashamed of everything that he is. And you see, uh, the central question we, we face is who am I? And if a Western education teaches you that you are nothing, you are despicable, you are just uh, 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 ignorant and savage barbarian, then you will have no incentive to look deeply into your uh, into who you are your own culture and your own heritage and to see you you won't see anything of value in there so you won't even examine it and that is uh, the inferiority complex that is created by western education and this does not help us in fact it's a great great obstacle to answering the most important question that life gives us which is how to live our own lives. And if you look at the other end, do you want to learn how to live our lives from these people in the West when more than 50% of the children growing up in the West are born to single mothers? That's the beginning of life where you don't even have a family. And the vast majority of uh, of uh, children today face uh, the problems of a uh, social network that's breaking down, families which are not uh, healthy in the ways that we have been taught uh, in Islam. And so uh, this education doesn't uh, help us deal with our life problems. You know, my, my own uh, economics teacher was a Nobel laureate, Stiglitz. And while uh, in uh, Stanford, uh, we learned that his wife had run away with another economist. So having an enormous amount of wisdom in economic theory doesn't teach you how to behave well towards your own wife. So doesn't tell us this Western education does not teach us how to live and how to live is the most important question. So um, all that was just the setup for the topics I want to discuss. And so basically, uh, and, and this was to basically persuade my audience that what Islam has to teach us is worth looking at because a Western education teaches us that no, nothing from our tradition is worth looking at, at least when it comes to this world. Yes, so our Muslims, Muslims like me, we, we learn to compromise. We say that, okay, Islam teaches us how we will earn the Jannah, but the West teaches us how to live in this world. So we, we, we make a division, which is actually a very deadly division, 
it is called the idea of secularism that there is a domain of knowledge which applies to this world and there is another domain of knowledge which applies to the akhirah and Islam teaches us about the akhirah how we can win the great success on the day of judgment but it has not much to say about how to uh, build cars and how to build atom bombs and how to build uh, highways and so all of this useful worldly knowledge we have to learn from the West but knowledge about the Akhirah we will learn from the Akhirah. Uh, knowledge about the Akhirah we will learn from the Quran. Now the distinction that the Quran teaches us and the uh, distinction that comes from us in the Hadith is between useful and useless knowledge and there is a world of difference between these two. Uh, useful knowledge Prophet Muhammad asked Allah for this useful knowledge and he sought protection from useful, useless knowledge. So, uh, but unfortunately this distinction does not exist in the Western intellectual tradition uh, and that is because the West cons considers that lives were created, uh, that the universe was created by an accident and so it is uh, our lives are meaningless and basically useful and useless are with respect to a purpose of life. If I have a purpose of life then useful knowledge is that knowledge which helps me achieve that purpose and useless is that which uh, prevents me from achieving this purpose. So now because the West uh, abandoned the idea of Christianity and of Akhira and of life after death so they focus their goals on this dunya. So West teaches us, Western education teaches us that useful knowledge is that which allows us to earn money which uh, uh, teaches us how we can get pleasure in this world and how, can, how we can make more profits from our corporations and business. So the western classification of what is useful depends on the purpose of that they teach us and basically the western purpose of life is based on this worldly life only because they rejected their own religion and uh, for the worldly life it is a very sensible thing to say that we should pursue pleasure and power and profits because what else is there? But this does not match Islamic ideas about what is useful and what is useless. And so we have to reshape all of the knowledge that has been produced into knowledge which will be useful for us to for the pursuit of the goals which are given to us by the Quran. And when we reshape knowledge in this way, we find that knowledge itself changes. So now we have to, before we analyze what knowledge is and how it is developed, we have to look at the roots of the Western intellectual tradition and this I will do very, very briefly, even though it is very important because I have covered it in much greater detail in other lectures. So briefly uh, in the West, um, about 300 years after Christianity uh, developed and emerged, uh, for various reasons, uh, there is a huge number of disputes that emerged. And basically, the, these disputes about Christianity emerged because some maybe 70 to 100 years after uh, the Prophet Isa was uh, lifted from this world, uh, his uh, followers or people in his tradition started uh, worshipping Isa salam himself and then uh, this caused a huge number of controversies because this was not part of the original Christian doctrine and uh, it led to uh, ultimately, when Emperor Constantine came into power, 
he said, uh, and he became Christian, he said that I don't want all of this controversy in my empire, I want just one religion. So he gathered all of the Christians and they, they had the Council of Nicaea and at this council <coughs> Trinity was declared the official doctrine of the church. But how did this happen? Well, basically they, they forged some uh, documents and they made these documents part of the Bible and this is something that Bart Ehrman, who was a very radical fundamentalist Christian and uh, so he has very deep knowledge of uh, Christianity itself. Uh, he has written many books and many articles and many videos on uh, how early Christianity developed this problem. But how this matters, I'm not here trying to create an argument between Islam and Christianity and I'm not trying to, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at a very, very different thing which emerges from this. Basically, Christians were faced with a huge problem. They had to prove that three equals one. And they had to prove it and they had to convince the masses of something which is basically false, contradictory and impossible. So they developed this method which we can call the axiomatic deductive methods. And this is actually at the basis of Western intellectual tradition today. And what is this axiomatic deductive method? Well, there are two things. There's what, what we are told that it is and what it actually is. So what we are told that it is, the axiomatic deductive methods, is that there are certain axioms, certain things that you must take for granted, that you accept. You, have, you cannot discuss these things, you cannot argue about them. They are just fundamental facts that everyone must accept and take for granted. And that is Trinity, for example. So if somebody says, how can this be? Well, just believe in it. You don't, you don't have to think about it. You don't have to argue about it. We, we're not going to tell you anything about what it is, where it comes from. This is just something that is a fundamental. You can't talk about it. <clears throat> so this methodology where some portion of the knowledge is placed as fundamental and it's not open for discussion. It is the, the pillars of the building which are hidden underground and the whole building is built on them. But those pillars, those, those uh, underground pillars, they are never open for examination or discussion or debate or argument. So this is, uh, this fundamental methodology comes from the need to prove lots of ridiculous and absurd things in Christianity. And this exact same methodology has been used in the development of Western physical sciences and also of social sciences. So, do not arouse the wrath of the great and powerful Oz. I said come back tomorrow. If you are really great and powerful, you keep your promises. Oh, I see. There is that. You presume to criticize the great right. Since we don't have sound, I will have to. So here is the scene from Wizard of Oz where these people are just extremely afraid but when they see that there is a man behind the curtain who is producing all this fire and smoke and he says, oh, don't look behind the curtain and so Dorothy walks up to the Wizard of Oz and says, who are you? Who are you? Oh, I, I, I am the great and uh, powerful He says, I am the great and powerful you wizard of Oz. So basically, you. No, I'm afraid it's true. Uh, a wizard except this you uh, great and powerful structure yes, of Western yes, exactly knowledge so I'm is just humbug. an illusion. Do not arouse the wrath of the great and powerful.
So <clears throat> this idea that uh, the West creates an illusion is also captured by the hadith about the Dajjal and uh, the Dajjal will say that I am a prophet but he will not be the prophet. There is no prophet after Prophet Muhammad and then he will say that I am the your Rabb but we will not see our Rabb until we die. So this is uh, and the fitna that he brings the Dajjal will be that he will have with him paradise and hell but actually his Jahannam will be the Jannah and his Jannah will be Jahannam and today people living outside the West think of the West as Jannah that they have advanced civilization, they have technology, they have every possible benefit and every possible thing which can please the nafs but those who are living inside that Jannah are actually living in Jahannam so the appearance is something and the reality is something else uh, the knowledge produced by the West is built on false foundations and we, which cannot be seen personally I was a teenager in at MIT and I had friends one of my friends was Paul Kinney and um, he, his father was a doctor at Columbia, a very rich man, but he divorced uh, his mother, went to live with some uh, married, some nurse, young nurse in his hospital. Paul was heartbroken. He spent his life searching for um, approval and love from his parents, which he couldn't get because they were busy with their own lives. And eventually he ended up committing suicide. So, uh, just saying that when a child grows up in a single parent family, he cannot get, he cannot possibly get the love that he deserves from uh, both parents who um, love and care for him and make him the focus of their attentions. When you have a single parent, of necessity she or he has to pursue um, their own um, life and careers and love lives and other things in addition to the child. So uh, regardless of how much they care for the child, they cannot provide him with the comfort and safety of a, of, of a home and uh, if you look at the teachings of Islam, you find how extremely important this is. So, one of the great defects of Western knowledge is it doesn't tell us how to build a good family, how to have good family life. And this is uh, one of the essential aspects of uh, creating a good life for our children and uh, also for our own uh, good life. Now, coming to the um, Western structures of knowledge, there are two separate kinds of knowledge. One is that of the physical sciences, which is indeed very glamorous. We are sending rocket ships to the moon and we are uh, uh, communicating by these computers and technology and we have these airplanes and satellites and ovens and refrigerators and all sorts of comforts. So the physical sciences and then there is the social sciences which claims to be of the same uh, type of knowledge as the physical sciences and this is one of the greatest uh, uh, greatest uh, tricks in the magic of the glitter and the glamour of the West that they tell us and they teach and they believe that social science and physical science, they are both science and so they are both equally valid. But actually, when um, if we take a leaf from the Bible, it says that you shall judge the tree by the fruit it bears. So, if somebody looks at the physical sciences, then they can say that, okay, our physical sciences have produced 
uh, miracles of nanotechnology and medicine and uh, all sorts of things. And for sure, there, they, there is a claim that is worth examining, worth uh, looking at. But what about the social sciences? The social sciences have produced uh, a, a dead uh, a place, uh, a, a society which is very, very bad. They're, in Britain, they appointed a minister of loneliness. The level of um, yani alcoholism, drinking, suicide, uh, drugs, uh, all sorts of uh, attempts to ar arrive at pleasure using any possible means and failing. Uh, this is the society which has been created in the West where a handful of people own half of the planetary wealth and more than a billion people are homeless and hungry and, and, and living in miserable conditions. And there is continuous wars ever since the 20th century with, uh, in which there are two world wars, 70 million people died, but all over the world um, uh, there are conflicts going on because the fundamental message of social science is that all is fair in love and war. That is, when you want to pursue pleasure and power, you can do anything like you like. There are no morals, no moral limits. And so, basically, the way to understand Western knowledge is to understand that social science is the religion of the West. It has no real basis. This economic theory that we study and political science and sociology and anthropology and all of the social sciences, they are part of a religion which replaced Christianity. This religion has no validity. It is a, it's a system of beliefs which is in direct conflict with Islam. And the physical sciences, they are the tools of this religion. They, they are, this religion basically, one of the key elements of this religion is that it is irrational to believe in the Akhirah because we have no empirical evidence for Akhirah or for God. So once, it, once there is no Akhirah, once there is no judgment, once the universe is a cold and cruel and harsh place, no one is watching what we are doing. If we do enormous amounts of evil, there is no punishment for it. And if we do a great deal of good, nobody will reward us for it. So once we accept this as ground realities, as the cold, harsh and cruel facts of life, then we learn that, well, um, if it is necessary to kill millions of people to have your uh, way, then do it. Uh, just like what happened in Iraq as the uh, Madeleine Albright, the, the US ambassador to the UN, said on, on uh, Nightline TV when she was asked a question, is it worth killing half a million children in Iraq to achieve your goals? And she said, yes, yes, this is a difficult question, but yes, I think it is worth it. So they are ready to kill half a million children to achieve political goals. And this is the this is the social science of the West, and this is what it teaches us. So Allah Ta'ala tells us that the value of a deed comes from the intention, the maqsad. And so we have to analyze, before we analyze the knowledge, we have to analyze the purpose for which this knowledge has been created. And then we will understand whether this knowledge is valuable. So actually it is not my intention to discuss the physical sciences in this lecture, it was not my intention, but I am going to come to the end of this, we are about uh, one hour into this talk, so I am going to stop. And so uh, thus the physical science I want to leave aside really, I don't want to discuss, that has a separate um, uh, set of issues. Physical science is indeed powerful knowledge. but then this knowledge has brought more harm to mankind than it has brought benefits. And this is something which is actually, actually the opposite of what the West is teaching us. According to the West, science has really brought enormous amounts of benefits to the mankind. So all I want to say is that we can dispute this narrative. I don't want to actually put forth the argument 
and I don't want to do the cost benefit analysis. I just want to say that this is an open to question. And let's put a parenthesis about this claim that, uh, and let's just put some, some ideas about how we can argue with this because our goal is not uh, to, our goal is really to just move our eyes away. And today our eyes are just uh, fascinated by Western technology. I just want to look away from this. So I just want to dispute this claim. I don't want to destroy it at this time. That would take a lot of work because this narrative, this Western narrative about the power of science and technology has taken very deep, deep root in our hearts and minds. So to take it out is a difficult task. It cannot be done by a few minutes of discussion. So all I want to say is that science has actually poisoned the planet. Today, despite all this science, a billion people are living under the poverty line. <clears throat> Ten people own half of the wealth of the planet. And science has actually enabled this immense concentration of power and wealth in the hands of very unscrupulous persons, who people who are, don't hesitate to uh, drop the Hiroshima bomb on innocent men, women and children and to fry them to death. And this planet is on the verge of a cl climate crisis and a disaster with polluted oceans, atmosphere and land. And all of this is thanks to science. So, <clears throat> if uh, the planet is destroyed, uh, this will be because of the science. And uh, there is this nice, uh, yani, uh, the disaster will take place when it takes place. So, an optimist is a person who jumps off the Empire State Building. And when he's passing the 42nd store floor, he says, so far, so good. I'm just enjoying this free fall. Science has played the power to destroy humanity in the hands of a few people who have no ethics, no morals. Uh, Stephen Hawking, he says that uh, currently humanity is like on a, on a canoe which is proceeding towards the Niagara Falls. And currently it's possible for us to reverse course with a massive amount of effort. But once you're over the fall, then that's it. There is no way to get back. So, I think that we are at the end <clears throat> and uh, basically uh, I haven't actually even began talking about the main topic of this talk which was to discuss the philosophic, the toxic philosophical foundations of Western knowledge. So, I'm going to just end by saying that there is knowledge of the heart and knowledge of the mind. The West has focused on the knowledge of the mind and rejected the knowledge of the heart. And this starts with Descartes. You know, when he said, I think, therefore I am, Descartes is called the father of Western philosophy. And he is pondering the question of whether or not he can establish his existence. And now, if you think that, Let's let's think. Let's suppose that for some reason, for some very strange reason, I am doubting my existence. Then what will I do? <clears throat> well, if I just uh, close my eyes, I will feel the tingling of my skin, the blood rushing through my veins. I will feel the pumping of my heart, and I will feel the air uh, touching my skin and giving rise to sensations. So I will know that I am alive. I will, I will feel that I am alive. But what does Descartes say? He says, I think. So actually, he explicitly rejects our human experience, our, our human beings, our, our feelings, our heart, our spirit, our soul. All of these are rejected as sources of knowledge in the Western tradition. The only source of knowledge is the brain. And the brain often makes a mistake. This deduction, I think, therefore I am, is an example of false logic, illogic. It is an argument which assumes its, uh, its conclusion. Because when you say the word I, you have already assumed that you exist. So, <clears throat> I, whatever I do, I exist. If you say I think, then the existence of the I is already assumed. So this is a 
example of a pseudo logical statement it, it doesn't really tell you anything it's it's actually ridiculous and absurd but this ridiculous and absurd logical deduction was celebrated as a great accomplishment of the father of western philosophy and uh, this was made the, the but, but the key the, the most important thing is that western knowledge does not address our heart does not address our spirit it does not allow us to learn from our personal experiences notice that what the west says is scientific knowledge is valuable but then when i learn to drive or when i learn how to behave well I, I learn how to control my anger learn how to be kind and compassion these are this is not scientific knowledge so according to the west it's not knowledge at all so i think i will stop here because one hour is up and i will uh